Theistic Evolution Critique, the New Testament. We've been looking at the book uh, Theistic Evolution, a Scientific, Philosophical, and Theological Critique. Um, <clears throat> it's discussing how you relate um, the w world history to uh, uh, religion in general, Christianity in particular. And um, there are several alternatives one can have. There's young life creationism. There's what is traditionally called old earth, but should be called old life creationism. Um, there is intelligent design friendly theistic evolution. There is evolution that denies that intelligent design can be deduced from the facts of nature. And finally, there is atheistic evolution where the reason why you can't detect design is because it isn't there. There is no designer. And um, <clears throat> uh, this particular book is not aimed at atheistic evolution. It's actually aimed at intelligent design unfriendly theistic evolution. The idea that God did it but he did it in such a way that you'd never know. This particular chapter is by Guy Prentiss Waters. It's in the section called The Biblical and Theological Critique, the third section of Theistic Evolution. And it is entitled, Theistic Evolution is Incompatible with the Teachings of the New Testament. Summary of what he has to say is this chapter claims that theistic evolution is incompatible with the teachings of the New Testament. It surveys the passages in the New Testament that address Adam and Eve as reported in Genesis 1 through 3 and also passages that reflect on the period of history covered in Genesis 4 through 11. It shows that the New Testament writers regarded the entirety of Genesis 1 through 11 in fully historical terms. The chapter also gives closer attention to two of the most extended New Testament expositions of Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22, and 44 through 49, and Romans 5, 12 through 21. Paul understands Adam to be as historical a figure as Jesus of Nazareth and the biological parent of the entire human race. He also attributes the entrance of sin and death into the human race to the first sin of Adam and shows that Adam's one sin is imputed to his natural posterity. The chapter finally shows the ways in which leading proponents of theistic evolution depart from the New Testament writer's testimony to Adam and Eve, thereby calling into question the historical under underpinnings of the gospel. And uh, our introduction is, at first glance it might appear that the testimony of the New Testament lies at the periphery of the discussions concerning the detailed historicity of Adam. The New Testament, after all, makes sparing explicit mention of Adam, although there are a few. Uh, these passages furthermore add little by the way of historical detail to the narratives of Genesis 1 to 2. Uh, the New Testament's witness to Adam, however, must sit at the very center of these discussions for at least two reasons. First, Christians properly recognize the New Testament as the final and climactic installment of God's inscripturated revelation to his people. As such, the New Testament revelation is possessed of a clarity and fullness that, relatively speaking, is lacking in the Old Testament revelation. This progressive character of special revelation requires that the Old Testament be read in the light of the New and not vice versa. Special revelation is also organic in character. One implication of Scripture's organic character is that the New Testament writers' statements about Old Testament people, events, or texts are true to the intention of the original Old Testament authors. We are therefore not in a position to dismiss the statements of Jesus or the apostles concerning the early chapters of Genesis. On the contrary, such statements are faithful expositions of the meaning of these earlier passages. Which is interesting because they just mentioned, he just mentioned that uh, uh, the, it doesn't bring up anything new. But it does second the entire story. Therefore, when the New Testament authors speak to the historicity of theological significance of Adam, that speech is regulative of our readings of the Old Testament passages that speak about Adam. The second reason for the importance of the New Testament's witness to Adam concerns the content of that witness. 
The Apostle Paul offers two extended reflections on the person and work of Adam in relation to the person and work of Christ. As we will see, the ways in which Paul tethers Adam to Christ has necessary implications for how we are to understand Adam's historicity and the relationship of Adam to the human race. Paul's reflections furthermore reveal a macrostructure not only to the history of redemption, but also to the whole of human history itself. One is therefore not in a position to regulate, relegate uh, Adam to the periphery of the apostles' theology. Furthermore, one is not able to extract Adam's historicity, his relationship with the human race, or his historical work from Paul's teachings without destroying the fundamental integrity of that teaching. In this chapter, we will first survey the passages in the New Testament that address Adam and Eve. In addition, in response to attempts to understand much or all of Genesis 1 through 11 in non-historical or semi-historical terms, we will also consider some of the New Testament's reflections on the period of history covered in Genesis 4 through 11. Second, we will look at the two most extended expositions of Adam in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22 and 44 through 49, which we mentioned before, and Romans 5, 12 through 21, which we also mentioned before. Here we will see that the Apostle Paul understood Adam to be a fiction, a figure as historical as Jesus of Nazareth and to be the biological parent of the entire human race. We will also see that Paul attributes the entrance of sin and death to the human race to the first sin of Adam and that Adam's one sin is imputed to his natural posterity. These New Testament teachings are incompatible with the views of contemporary advocates of theistic evolution. That's not to say you couldn't have a theistic evolution that might kind of partly fit but contemporary advocates tend to dispense with Adam altogether. Third, we will survey the ways in which some proponents of theistic evolution have read these New Testament passages, especially Paul's statements concerning Adam in 1 Corinthians and Romans. We will conclude that these readings fail to satisfy the demands of the text. We will also see that these readings effectively undermine the Apostle Paul's authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ and call into question the historical underpinnings of the gospel that Paul preached. Adam and Eve in the New Testament. What is the testimony of the New Testament to Adam and Eve? We will first consider what the New Testament writers explicitly say about Adam and Eve. We will then broaden our horizon of study to explore the New Testament's testimony to the events recorded in Genesis 4 through 11. Adam and Eve in the New Testament, Luke 3.38. In one of the two New Testament genealogies of Jesus, Luke identifies Jesus as the son, as was supposed of Joseph, the son of Heli. And then Luke proceeds to trace Jesus' descent back to Adam, the son of God. And there's uh, the text. Jesus, when he began his ministry, is about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed of Joseph, son of Heli, son of Methat, yada, 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 yada the son of Mahaliel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Boom. Setting aside the exegetical questions attending this passage and the challenges of harmonizing this genealogy with that of Matthew, we may draw a few observations along the way in, about the way in which Luke presents Adam in this genealogy. First, Adam appears among dozens of figures whom the biblical writers regard as fully historical. Jacob, Isaac, Abraham, Noah, Seth, Adam, God. There is no basis for exempting Adam from this grouping as a non-historical or semi-historical figure. Second, Adam is placed at the head of linear geolo genealogical sequence. Each of the human beings in, in Luke 3.23c uh, to 38a traces his descent from Adam. Part of Luke's objective in presenting this genealogy is to show that Jesus, who traces his descent from Adam, is thereby qualified to be the redeemer of all kinds of people. Back of this message is Luke's conviction that all human beings trace their descent from Adam. Third, Adam is a historical person and genealogical progenitor is the first man. Luke recognizes no progenitor of Adam and thereby exempts him from the normal sequence of biological parentage that follows Adam. The reason for this unique circumstance is that Adam is descended from no man. Adam is rather the son of God, a reference to his special creation in Genesis 1 and 2. 
all human beings trace their descent from Adam, while Adam traces his descent from no human. In view of these observations, it is surprising to see Old Testament professor Peter Enns, an advocate of theistic evolution, claim that the issues raised by these genealogies add little to the conversation about the historicity of Adam. Well, they do add little, because the historicity is already firmly established before we get to this. But the point of it is, this is one more pin, and one more strand in that rope that argues Adam is historical. Ends is wrong. Wheaton College professor John H. Walton, on the other hand, acknowledges the theological significance of Luke's genealogy, but dismisses it as a testimony either to the historicity of Adam or to Adam as progenitor of the entire human race. He says that we are simply meant to understand Adam as the first significant human, who by virtue of his very particular role as federal head and priest had a special connection with God. He admits that Luke may well have understood Adam to be the first human being, but says that God merely used Luke's com contemporary concepts as a framework for communication. Think about what he's saying. Luke believed it. Luke wrote it. But it's not really normative for us. The problem with Walton's analysis is that Luke is founding a theological claim upon a historical foundation. If Adam is merely the first significant human and not the first human being and the progenitor of all human beings, then Luke's claim that Jesus, by virtue of his genealogy, is qualified to be the redeemer of all human beings is void. To separate the historical and the theological in Luke's genealogy is to forfeit them both. Acts 17.26, a second reference to Adam in Luke's writings appears in his account of Paul's address to the Areopagus in Athens. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Although Paul does not mention Adam by name, he testifies to the universal descent of humanity from a single man, whom Paul knew to be Adam in various other contexts. The Greek text underlying this translation does not explicitly use the word man. It leads literally from one. But since the Greek word one, henos, is a masculine singular noun, the translation from one man is legitimate. In fact, it's the obvious one. Some proponents of theistic evolution have argued that Paul is not referring to Adam in this expression. Walton argues that the referent is Noah, he concludes that Paul's concern in this speech is national origins, not biology or human origins. Paul is therefore said to be referencing the Septuagint translation of Genesis 10.32, in which the nations of the earth are said to originate from the three sons of Noah. I'm not sure how that helps, because that would imply that Noah was the male head of everything, in which case the flood was real and worldwide, at least worldwide, everywhere where humans had spread at that point, I'm not sure you win anything by arguing that it was Noah instead. instead. Paul, however, must be referring to Adam. David Peterson rightly concludes that the phrase on all the face of the earth echoes the teachings of Genesis 1, 28-29, thereby identifying the one man as Adam. Romans 5, 12 through 21, this significant passage begins by saying, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. The second section we'll skip over a little bit. And then 1 Corinthians 11, 8 through 9, for man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Paul does not mention Adam and Eve by name in 1 Corinthians 11, 8, 8 through 9, but obviously he intends that. Adam and Eve are historical persons, and Eve is specially created by God from Adam. And there's a bunch of stuff that I meant to put green on that I missed. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, this is our familiar passage that we'll deal with more in more depth later. This long discussion about the resurrection includes significant parallels and differences between Adam and Christ, such as this, for as by man came death, by man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so shall also shall in Christ shall all be made alive. And then there's a second section. We're going to skip over that at this point because we'll deal with it in much more detail later. 
First Corinthians 11.3, But I am afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ, obviously referring to Eve as a historical figure. Paul regards this account to be a thoroughly historical account. Skipping over a little bit. Uh, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over man. Rather, she is to be, remain quiet. For Adam was for, formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Although, you could say Adam's sin was worse because he knew what he was doing. Um, Paul cited these specific details in the life of Adam and Eve only because he took Genesis 2-3 through as literal history not as mythological, figurative, or allegorical stories. Paul is treating the accounts of the creation and the fall as historical accounts that serve as the norm for the way in which human beings subsequent to Adam and Eve are to relate to one another. Walton has argued that Paul is using an Adam and Eve as illustrations for the Ephesians and nothing more. He dismissed an ontological understanding of Paul's words on the basis that such an understanding would require Paul to say not only that man by his creation created nature is first, but also the woman by her created nature is deceivable. Since, however, that vulnerability, that is susceptibility to deception, is not ontological to only one gender, Paul's words cannot be ontologically referential. But Paul does not say here or elsewhere that women are inherently gullible. What undergirds Paul's injunction in verse 12 is the historical fact that Eve on this particular occasion was deceived not that Eve was created as a gullible person. Paul then is treating the account of Genesis 1-3 through 3 as fully historical narrative. Jude 14, in the midst of a warning, Jude 3-16, through 16, about false teachers who are threatening the churches of, of which Jude's readers are a part, Jude reminds his audience that these false teachers were the con concern of earlier prophecy. Specifically, Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with ten thousands of his holy ones. Jude treated Enoch as a historical personage. Many scholars have observed the similarities between the words that Jude recorded here and 1 Enoch 1.9, a pseudepigraphical book authored between the 3rd and 1st centuries BC that has a complicated literary history. Some have argued that Jude quotes from a book that his opponents regard as authoritative, but that Jude did not. Others more plausibly have suggested that Jude regarded these words as a historically accurate, authentic utterance of the prophet Enoch and utterance that in the providence of God was preserved in First Enoch. Walton has characterized the words of Jude 14 through 15 as a literary factuality. Yes, this is how the familiar story goes, rather than a historical factuality. Yes, this is what really happened in time and space. Jude then is quoting a myth or story that has that is a part of the common cultural vocabulary of his audience to take Jude as historically factual Walton reasons requires one to conclude that the historical Enoch was the author of the intertestamental book of Enoch. I'm not sure that's exactly true. Surely this is an unnecessary inference that Jude identifies Enoch with a precise genealogical marker and quotes him in the train of a host of historical Old Testament references, Jude 5 through 11, indicates Jude's understanding of Enoch in Jude 14 through 15 as his historical person. That Enoch is said to be the seventh from Adam, furthermore, requires the conclusion that Jude understood Adam to be no less a historical person than Enoch. The New Testament writers do not separate the events of the first two chapters of Genesis from conventional space-time history. Both Adam and Enoch, furthermore, occupy the same historical space as other events that Jude mentions from the Pentateuch. The Exodus, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and there's the quotes that mention them. Cain's murder of Abel, the prophetic activity of Balaam, and Korah's rebellion in June, Jude 11. Woe to them, for they walk in the way of Cain and abandon themselves for the sake of Bain and, uh, Gain and Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. Other texts about Genesis 1 through 11 in the New Testament. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Many commentators have observed how the opening line of Matthew's Gospel intentionally echoes portions of the book of Genesis. Specifically, Matthew's opening words, the book of the genealogy, 
are the identical with the Septuagint translation of Genesis 2.4. These are generations of the heaven and earth when they were created in the days that the Lord made the earth and the heavens. And Genesis 5.1, this is the book of the generation of, of Adam. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. What is significant? What is the significance of this Matthewan literary connection with Genesis? First, Matthew intends for his reading to understand readers to understand that his historical account of the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in the light of the biblical narrative of Genesis. Second, this connection shows that Matthew understands the narrative of Genesis to be as fully historical as the narrative of Jesus Christ that follows. Matthew 1, 1 through 17. Matthew 19, 4 through 6. And this is a really key one. He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning, that's a quote, made them male and female, that's another quote, and said, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And of course, that's a quote. So there are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Which is said in weddings all over Christendom. Jesus addresses the institution of marriage at the creation at Matthew 19, 4 through 6, citing Genesis 2, 24. We are not at liberty to say with Dennis O'Lamoreau that Jesus was accommodating to the Jewish belief of the day that Adam was a real person. The distinction that Jesus draws between the grant of certificate of divorce through Moses and the beginning is a fundamentally historical one. Jesus therefore understands the institution of marriage and the subsequent giving of the law through Moses to exist on a single historical continuum. Furthermore, Jesus' statement, but from the beginning it was not so, independently testifies to the fall of humanity in Adam as marking a decisive shift in the human experience of marriage. Jesus' words assume the universal ramifications of Adam's one sin for the entire human race. And in fact, argues that we should go back to Genesis rather than to uh, the Mosaic Law. He doesn't say that, but I do. So that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. And the parallel passage from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary, yes, I tell you, it will, will be required of this generation. In this statement, Jesus refers, references Cain's murder of Abel, Genesis 4. He places that event on the same historical continuum as the martyrdom of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, recorded at Chronicle, uh, first, Second Chronicles 24-21. Scholars dispute the precise identification of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, but many have plausibly identified him with the prophet Zechariah mentioned in Second Chronicles 24-20-22-55. On this identification, Jesus is speaking about the range of martyred prophets across the Old Testament canon, Genesis through Chronicles, the Old Testament canon, of course, being the Hebrew Old Testament canon. Jesus' words are not only a testimony to the historicity of Abel, but also te a testimony to the historicity of the entirety of Genesis. We have no reason to doubt, then, that Jesus regarded the entirety of the events of Genesis to be fully historical. Matthew 24 and Luke 17, for as the days were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and almost identical, thus it, uh, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son, Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage till the day when Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Jesus here predicts the sudden character of his return in glory to judge the world. Unbelievers will not be prepared for his return and will be taken by surprise when it happens. Jesus likens this state of affairs to the days of Noah. Jesus' warning employs an analogy that requires Jesus' acceptance of the historicity of Noah and of the biblical narrative about Noah. And I'm curious as to how this managed to get through the editors when they were trying to keep neutral over the uh, uh, over the age of uh, life on earth, but anyway, and then Romans eight eighteen through twenty three. 
For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. But we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. The creation was subjected, apparently at some point in the past. Before that, it was not. That the creation was subjected to futility means two things. First, the present state of affairs here described by Paul did not characterize creation as at its inception. Second, creation did not choose, as it were, its present condition. God has consigned the creation to its present condition. We have, therefore, an obvious reference to the Genesis 3 narrative and a commentary on Genesis 3:17 and 18. Hebrews 11, 1 through 7. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable uh, sacrifice than Cain through which he was commended as righteous and uh, so forth. Uh, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. Now, before he was taken up, he was commended as having pleased God, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Notice all these people. These are the beginning of the faith chapter, of course. The writer to the Hebrews presents a table of examples of persevering faith in Hebrews 1 through 40, 11, 1 through 40. Beginning with the creation, the writer draws examples of faith from Abel and the ones that follow him, and then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, multiple judges and prophets, some named and some unnamed. While the writer has clear ex exhortatory purposes in this catalog, the very nature of the writer's exhortations to persevere in faith require that each of the individuals named be f flesh and blood human beings. Non-historical figures could not, be, could not persuasively model persevering faith for historical people. Hebrews 12, 24, And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. In the previous chapter, the writer to the Hebrews references Abel as a historical person. In this chapter, the writer once again references Abel in the same fashion. In placing Abel and Jesus in the relations that he does, the writer understands Abel to be as historical a figure as he understands Jesus to be. First Peter 3.20, Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Peter treats the narrative of Genesis 6 through 9 as fully historical in character. Second Peter 2, 5, He did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Peter encourages his readers by appealing to God's preservation of his people in times fast. If God was willing to preserve his people then, Peter reasons he is no less willing to preserve his people now. That Peter makes such an argument indicates his conviction that the events of Genesis 6 through 9 are fully historical in nature. John 3, uh, 1 John 3.12 We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. John's argument treats the account of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4 as relating fully historical events. Jude 11, Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's heir and perished in Korah's rebellion, which we just saw not that long ago. The significance of Adam in the New Testament. This is section 2. We have surveyed the 
testimony of multiple New Testament authors to the historicity of Adam and Eve, and they affirm much more than the mere fact that there once existed two individuals named Adam and Eve. Without exception, the New Testament writers uphold the full historicity of both Adam and Eve, affirming many specific details about their lives as recorded in Genesis 1 through 3. We should finally register the fact that no New Testament author mounts an apologetic for the historicity of the events under review. The, notion, the, the reason that they amount no apologetic is that none was needed in the first century church. We have no record from the New Testament of any early Christian denying the historicity of Adam, Eve, or any person or event from the opening chapters of Genesis. They took it as it was written. The Apostle Paul offered two extended reflections on Adam in 1 Corinthians and in Romans, and I will now consider these passages in more detail. 1 Corinthians... Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians 15 is in three parts. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11, Paul defends the bodily resurrection as an essential part of the gospel I preach to you. Um, in verses 12 to 34, he addresses the that of the bodily resurrection. How does it happen? And verse 35 to 38, he addresses the how of the body bodily resurrection. Oh, I, I'm sorry, that it happened. Paul addresses Adam in the latter two sections of the argument of the chapter. The section that is most relevant for our purposes is, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of them that have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. A passage which you may recognize as, as uh, being used in the Messiah. In verse 22, Paul sets an antithetical parallel, Adam and Christ. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. We may draw two important implications from Paul's statements in these verses. First, the parallel that Paul establishes between Adam and Christ not only requires that each be a representative figure, but also that each be a representative man. To question or compromise the humanity of the one is necessarily to question or compromise the humanity of the other. Second, Paul's claim about Adam and Christ in these verses lies not on the periphery but at the heart of his gospel. The resurrection is among the matters of first importance that Paul delineates at verses 3 through 4. Paul continues his comparison of Adam and Christ in verses 44 through 49. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. For, and of course, uh, that's a quote from Genesis 2, the first man Adam became a living being. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was a man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as a man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. The man of dust, of course, was created from dust by the record. As Richard B. Gaffin, Jr. has observed in 1 Corinthians 5, 44b through 49, Paul's perspective is the most comprehensive possible, covering nothing less than the whole history of, whole of human history, from its beginning to its end, from the original creation to its consummation. In 1 Corinthians 15, 44 through 49, both Adam and Christ are representative persons. Adam is the first man, Adam, and the first man. Christ is the last, Adam, and the second man. In verses 44 through 49, Paul's perspective on Adam is decidedly on Adam before he sinned. That is to say, Adam is in view as created but not yet fallen. The citation of Genesis 2-7 at 1 Corinthians 15-45a, the first man Adam became a living being, confirms Paul's interest in Adam prior to his sin, to his fall into sin. Skipping over a bunch... The other place in Roman in Paul's correspondence where he offers an extended reflection on Adam and Christ is Romans 5, 12 through 21. These verses raise many issues that range widely across Paul's theology. We will confine our attention to the implications of what Paul says here for Adam's historicity. And I'm just going to quote the verse because it's not actually in the text. That, uh, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread through all men because all have sinned. For sin was indeed in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. 
I guess that implies that there was a law before the law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses even those, over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the gra that grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. Again, we're referring to Adam. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Notice again this contrast and, and comparison between Adam and Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to a condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as the... By the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. As in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul sets Adam and Christ in parallel. On the one hand, there is Adam, or as Paul refers to him in this passage, the one man, twice. On the other hand, there is Jesus Christ, who is also referred to as one man. Each is a representative person. The destinies of many hang upon the actions of Adam and Christ. Skipping over a number of paragraphs. Theistic evolutionary readings of Paul, uh, especially those two passages. How have proponents of theistic evolution approached and understood the Apostle Paul's two extended reflections on the person and work of Adam? We may answer that question by exploring what three proponents, Dennis Alexander, John H. Walton, and Peter Enns, have argued from these passages. Because Alexander, Walton, and Enns are not altogether agreed upon these passages' meaning, we will address each separately. Dennis Alexander, skipping over a few things, Paul understands Adam to be a real person, a historical figure, no less than Jesus himself was. This is Enns, uh, pardon me, Alexander, acknowledging that for Paul, Adam was a historical, really historical figure which means that if Enns disagrees, he has to just simply say Paul was mistaken. Alexander is unwilling to say from Romans 5 that physical death originated in Ad with Adam. He makes this point explicit in his exposition of 1 Corinthians 15. According to Alexander, Paul sees physical death in 1 Corinthians 15 as the normal state of humankind and always has been. This is the status of earthly men. It's what you expect. The cross and the resurrection, however, conquered not only spiritual death but also physical death. With death so comprehensively nullified, we are therefore qualified to enter the kingdom. So ends, uh, Alexander believes that this is um, that this is actually true, but disagrees with whether uh, uh, whether Adam was a really historical person, or certainly not the historical beginning of humanity. Third, Alexander acknowledges the difficulty in affirming two propositions. On the one hand, all human beings have a universal propensity to sin that is traceable to the first sin of Adam. On the other hand, we may not use the language of inheritance to explain this state of affairs, nor may we explain any process of transmission in terms of or in light of a genetic relationship between Adam and his posterity, because Adam wasn't the progenitor of all humans. Scott McKnight, has, uh, who has a similar position, has argued that the Adam of Paul was not the historical Adam. But Paul thought he was. For Paul, McKnight insists Adam is literary and genealogical. Well, I guess for McKnight, he's denying that, uh, that Paul really believed in Adam. That is, the entire history of Israel is built upon Adam in the Old Testament, which is true. In company with other Second Temple Jewish writers, Paul is said to have conceived Adam as an archetypal and moral figure. Well, yeah, but also historical. This understanding of sin and redemption is indisputably semi-Pelagian and arguably Pelagian. The unorthodox view that we are not born with a sinful nature but are able to choose by our own moral strength to obey God. These formulations follow directly on McKnight's denial of the full historicity of Adam. Skipping over a little more, John Walton's 
uh, on Paul's understanding of Adam. Although Wheaton Old Testament professor John H. Walton has con- concentrated his conten- attention on the Old Testament writer witness to Adam, he has also addressed what Paul had to say about Adam in 1 Corinthians 15 and Romans 5. Walton argues that in both Testaments, Adam appears as an archetype. An archetype, as Walton has recently defined the term, refers to a representative of a group in which all others in the group are embodied. As a result, all members of the group are included and participate with their representative. Walton distinguishes the historical existence of such a figure as Adam from his archetypal significance in the biblical literature. The recognition that the New Testament authors believe Adam and Eve to be real individuals in a real past, as do I, is distinct from the theological or archetypal use that is made of them. It is an archetype that the New Testament writers are said to have an interest in Adam. Paul is not interested in committing his readers to the proposition that Adam was the first human being or that we must all be related biologically or genetically to Adam or or that sin is passed through biological relationship. Paul does commit us, however, to the reality of sin and death entering human experience in an event with the implication that there is a historical Adam. So you'd say there is an Adam, just not necessarily the progenitor of everyone. Walton draws similar conclusions from 1 Corinthians 15, 22, and 45. Although Adam is the first man, he cannot be the first biological specimen because Christ was not the last biological specimen. Interesting argument. Paul has no interest in genetic relationships of human beings with Adam or material origins other than saying that we share the dust nature of the archetype. Uh, Although has made of one man all nations of earth, kind of argues against that kind of position. Walton argues that Adam and Eve were drawn from a larger human population, all of whom whom as human beings were in the image of God, and that these two were appointed representative priests for humanity. Adam and Eve are not de novo creations. Appealing to Romans 5.13, Walton argues that prior to Adam and Eve, when law or revelation was first given, there was no sin, no consciousness of relationship, no immorality. They were behaving badly and committing evil, but they were not morally accountable to God for their actions, nor were they in a personal conscious relationship with God. I guess, and then God revealed, and then Adam and Eve rebelled. The state of affairs changed when Adam and Eve sinned. They brought sin to the entire entire human race by bringing accountability. Furthermore, their sin made the antidote to death inaccessible. How particularly does Adam's sin reach subsequent generations of human beings? Walton suggests that the world got polluted because of that first act, disorder let loose and run amok, and we are thereby infected from this world. We are born into a toxic environment and suffer the consequences both universally and particularly. Skipping over a bunch more, Peter ends on Paul's understanding of Adam. Old Testament professor Peter Enns, who is now at Eastern University and is also a senior fellow in biblical studies with the Biologos Foundation, argues that previous generations have not adequately reckoned with Paul as a first century reader of Old Testament scripture. When we do so, we will necessarily have to adjust our understanding of Adam. Decisive for Paul's reading of the Old Testament was his experience of the risen Christ. This experience drives his reading of the Old Testament in general, a reading that is creative. What then were the contours of this reading? Paul had a high view of Christ which required his recasting of Israel's story, specifically Adam, uh, to account for Christ. For this reason, Paul invests Adam with capital he does not have either in the Genesis story, the Old Testament as a whole, or the interpretations of his contemporary Jews. Paul's understanding of Adam is shaped by Jesus, not the other way around. So Paul thought Adam was a real person and so forth, but he was wrong. Skipping over, what then does Paul say about Adam and how are these statements said to stem from his prior experience of the risen Christ? Adam is both a theological and historical figure for Paul. Oh, very uh, upfront about that. Paul assumed that Adam was the first man created by God from whom the human race descended and from whom all inherited sin and death. Enns insists that if we take Paul's theology with utmost seriousness, we are not also bound to accept Paul's view of Adam's 
that's it, of Adam historically. Why is this? All that is essential to the gospel is that we accept the reality of human plight of sin and death and of God's unexpected universal solution. So Paul believed it, but we don't have to. For ends part, we are free to say that Adam is not the first historical man, a uh, historical first man, and thereby leave Paul behind Paul's understanding of the cause of the universal plight of sin and death. He's right about the universal plight, but he's not right about the cause. The need for a savior does not require a historical Adam. Why? Because there was no historical Adam, so we're going to have to adjust Christianity to deal with that. Alexander and Walton claim a shared belief with the Apostle Paul concerning the existence and activity of a historical Adam. Their conception of Adam, however, is markedly different from that of most Christians and, as we have argued, from that of Paul himself. Enns, however, argues for a Pauline understanding of Adam that, is more, that more closely approximates classical understandings of the person of Adam. Unlike Alexander and Walton, however, Enns senses a freedom explicitly to disagree with and to shed the Pauline understanding of Adam. Skipping over a bunch, we get to the conclusion. The New Testament authors speak with one voice about the person and work of Adam. Adam is a historical man, not mythological or semi-historical. Adam is the first man specifically created by God. Adam is the progenitor of the human race. All people, except for Jesus Christ, descend from Adam by natural generation. And even Jesus Christ half descended that way. Adam is furthermore a representative man. His first sin had been imputed to his natural posterity. As a result, we are all guilty of Adam's first sin. We are now all justly subject to death, and sin now reigns in death. The reigning depravity and corruption of sin and the consequences of sin death are the norm for all those who are in Adam. Some proponents of theistic evolution have attempted to reconcile modern evolutionary theory with the teachings of the New Testament. These efforts are not uniform, but we have observed certain patterns emerging. First, what we have summarized as the united testimony of the New Testament concerning Adam is rejected. Each proponent surveyed refuses to affirm the biological descent of all human beings from a common and first ancestor, Adam. Each refuses to affirm that the transgression of Adam marked the alpha point of sin and evil into humanity. Second, proponents whom we have surveyed advance understandings of sin and death that strike at the integrity of the biblical gospel. All agree that sin pervades present human experience, and some will find ways to trace the universality of human sin to Adam. Such explanations, however, are invariably vague and imprecise. We are left wondering how and under what circumstances a person becomes a sinner. Furthermore, death is presumed to be a standing and perennial part of the human experience, presumably even at Adam's time. Such imprecision concerning death, sin and death cannot bode well for the gospel. The gospel, as we observed, comes to us in a particular redemptive historical framework. The work of Christ is set forth and expl explicated in the light of the work of the representative man, Adam. Christ presents the solution to our Adamic plight. But if our plight is other than what the New Testament writers present it, represent it to be, then how can the gospel solution proffered by the New Testament writers be a solution to our genuine plight? On what basis can the church proclaim to the world a gospel that proposes a solution to a non-existent problem? And of course, that is where atheists will hammer that question. These questions underscore the fact that the New Testament writings cannot be accommodated to theistic evolution apart from transforming their teachings in a fundamental fashion. This observation in no way militates against Christian un Christians undertaking the hard and necessary work of participating in and engaging the broader scientific community. It is simply to say that underlying this engagement is a deep and perennial hermeneutical question. Will the regnant scientific consensus determine what the Bible may or may not say, or will the Bible be permitted to speak for itself? We may be grateful that on the important matters before us, human origin, sin, death, and salvation, that the, the Bible is not silent and it speaks with clarity a message that is truly good news to the perishing. Now, my take on all this. Waters does a good job of establishing that the various writers of the New Testament read the bio Hebrew Bible in a way that might be characterized as pre-critical. 
It is not that they were particularly stupid. On the contrary, that is the most natural way to read the Bible, is pretty critically. The real problem is that the Bible record, biblical record was written by people who believed in miracles when there was what they believed was appropriate evidence. They were not necessarily gullible in general. They simply, if, if you had enough evidence, they accepted the idea it was a miracle. This evidence no longer satisfies what some would call science. Now, theistic evolutionists take the conclusion of that kind of science as given and then try to fit the Bible into it. It is a difficult task, and I don't envy them. What they forget is that certain aspects of science were specifically designed not to fit with the Bible. No wonder they don't fit. For some, that is a feature, not a bug. Um, there's a a problem that's um, floating around on the internet goes a plus b equals 12, a minus c equals 9, c plus d equals 2, and b minus d equals 14. Now, if you do a little math, you can find this because a plus b equals 12, then b equals 12 minus a, and because a minus c equals 9, then 12, uh, b equals 12 minus 9 plus c, and that means that b equals 3 minus c. And because b minus d, uh, pardon me, uh, c plus d equals 2, then, it, uh, then b equals 3 minus 2 minus d, or b equals 1 plus d. And the problem, of course, is that b equals 14 plus d as well. You can't square that. The only way you can square that is to say that 14 equals 1. That is to say there is no solution to this problem. One of those premises is wrong, period. There are only three logical alternatives. Either the natural interpretation of the Bible is right, or science is right, which was designed to disagree with the Bible in certain points. Or they're both wrong. That could also be true. The idea that they both can be right is not logically coherent. And that's why people are struggling so hard to fit the Bible with modern science. Now, this book started out showing that that modern science, which you might call the current scientific consensus, is wrong on scientific grounds. That does not prove the Bible, but it does leave the door open for the Bible to be considered. And frankly, I think the Bible will do quite well for itself if consideration is allowed for it. That is, I think we need to abandon the current scientific consensus. Not the concept of science itself, the idea of hypotheses and testing and stuff like that, but the conclusion the science has, has made for itself, uh, I think, has been done in a not completely unbiased way. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. I think that there's one comment I will make uh, since nobody else is commenting, and that is that it is very fortunate, uh, strategically valuable, that uh, science has, uh, that the book is r arranged the way it was, because if one did not, If one did not accept the idea that science could be wrong on this, the net result of the biblical presentations would be that people would simply throw away the Bible. 
And that's why I think it is absolutely incumbent on us to look at the science carefully. Uh, it, is, it is interesting that in our immediate community, there are those who have claimed that we need to look at the Bible more carefully. I don't think so, because I think the Bible is clear enough on its own. I think the real problem is we need to look at science more carefully, which is, of course, precisely what they're trying to avoid us doing. Because that involves the possibility that the current scientific consensus is wrong, and that involves that we may wind up at loggerheads with that scientific consensus. Just uh, keep keep talking. It'll it'll come on. Okay. One point I made was that uh, Adam couldn't have been first because Christ wasn't last, and I did, I don't pick I didn't pick up the how that logic was made. It's if it reads forward, it it's supposed to read backwards as well. It's, so it's like a palindrome. It didn't really make sense. Uh, well, so as an Adam all dies, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Well, that implies that there must be some time after Christ for, for those who are going to be made alive to find out about it and become alive. And I, th I think that that's a, uh, um, that's a point that, uh, uh, that kind of destroys that argument that Christ must be the last as Adam is the first. Although, to be fair... If Christ comes a second time, Christ will be the last as well. As long as time progresses in one direction, it makes sense, but they reverse time, and so naturally, to me, it doesn't make sense then. Yeah. Uh, no, the argument is a weak one. It's being used because they don't have a stronger one. It, it may be a simplistic way to look at things, but there's a verse in Romans 1.20. It says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his internal power and divine nature have been clear, clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. And it... <coughs> It seems to me that the devil's way of looking, of having evolution, is to make it so that men look at, at creation and no longer see God in it. Well, that was the, actually the intention. Uh, I didn't mean it was the intentions of the scientists who thought I, I'm attributing it to the devil. Well, I understand that too. Although for some scientists that is also the intention because they look at creation and they see ugliness and so what they want to do is to say God was not the author of this so let's just get God out of the picture. On the other hand, uh, the Bible never really said that this world is set up perfectly. In fact, it specifically denies it. The creation is groaning. It was subjected. Um, but uh, the, the mistake that's being made is actually a, a fairly obvious one if you think about it. The fact that there is bad design does not mean that there was not a good designer at one point. Or a good design to begin with. A good design to begin with. Um, uh, you know, a, a kitchen knife is very useful for cutting vegetables if you're a meat eater, meat. Um, is, you know, but a kitchen knife can be refashioned, you know, to be put on the barrel of the gun and become a bayonet and to be used for very ugly things. Um, 
a, a design that makes a nuclear power plant that allows electricity to be made without having to use um, coal, that same power can be redesigned to make an atomic bomb. Um, and the fact that the, the fact that the original design was was good does not mean that the that the end use is is now good, but the fact that the end use that is now there is not good does not mean uh, that the original use was good was not good, uh, and that and that it was not designed in any case. Because the fact of the matter is that an AK-47 is designed. You know, an AR-15 is designed. Um, and things that were originally for good use, you know, the Bible talks about beating plowshares into swords. The plowshare had to be made deliberately by refining iron. And the fact that it's been beaten into a sword when it was originally a plowshare does not mean that the original design was bad. It's, it's, an, it's really an elementary mistake once you realize that. Yes. I have been struggling with trying to understand where the boundary is between the kind of theistic evolution this book tends, it seems to me, addresses, and athe atheism. I, I, I don't find a boundary. Um, there are two things to be said about that. One of them is that the boundary can become vague and people can slip over it. Best example I can give you is Howard Van Til. Pardon me? The best example I can give you is Howard Van Til, okay. who started out with an evolutionary creationism that was pretty firm about God was running it, but we couldn't tell. And after a while went to, well, God isn't actually running it. Um, that vague boundary is actually a small help as well because a number of people, the most prominent one that I can point to you right now is Francis Collins, have come the other way over that boundary. Francis Collins doesn't realize it but he is a partial intelligent design advocate. He protests, but he acknowledges that God can be discerned in the Big Bang. And he acknowledges that God can be observed in the human heart. The only thing he doesn't want to do is take that same logic on the origin of life. Because, you see, if you take it on the origin of life, or for that matter, if you take it on evolution, then suddenly you have to set yourself against the current scientific consensus. The current scientific consensus starts to get vague about what caused the Big Bang, and there are people who say, I don't want God, so therefore I'll accept multiple universes. <clears throat> and that's in the literature, almost that bluntly. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, you, you, you toy with evolution or you even toy with the origin of life being insoluble without intelligence. Them's fighting words. And that's why intelligent design gets in trouble with the scientific establishment. Because what it's implying is, and this is an important distinction, 
what it is really implying is that science cannot be made safe for atheism. <laughs> and if you want to know, that's the, that's the line you cannot cross. And that's why theistic evolutions, as long as they stay on that side of the line, they're okay. Once they step across, they're no longer treated as the um, Muslims who treat dhimmis. You know, you pay us your tribute, we'll leave you alone. They are now treated as enemies who must be destroyed. And of course, we're too civilized to burn people at the stake. <laughs> but they'll try virtually anything else. And as recent events have been showing, we're starting to edge closer to that burning at the stake idea. You know, doxing and all that kind of stuff. Standing outside of people's houses and yelling that they're murderers and trying to keep them up at night. This is, but what to me is perhaps most striking is ultimately the atheistic approach. Only way of, of not, of simply laying obvious design aside is a totally, totally un, unevaluatable, pardon my coining English, approach of multiverse that that's the only answer they've got that's right to, to deal with the obvious design and of course the next question is and how is it that we can pre prepare universes each with their own special laws so that randomly we hit the right one you know how could that universe exist if they're simply random is there a universe generating machine somewhere well, and who designed the machine in other words, it the, puts it one step back. The is proposal all. is so vague, so purposely cannot be evaluated, etc. That it seems like that's the they're really saying this is the only safe ground we can we can create. Yeah, put quotes around create. Let's see. Darwin's theory was intended to distance the, com the creator from his creation so that he didn't have to deal with the idea that cats catch mice, that wasps lay caterpillars in the bodies of their uh, insect victims, those kinds of things. That's what it was designed for. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what people don't realize is that it started before Darwin. Lyell specifically wanted to free the science from Moses, which presumes that Moses was wrong, and we, so we need to free the science from Moses. And once you understand that it was set up so the answer cannot work, then us trying to rearrange Christianity to fit that is nuts. But again, the, the multiverse idea is unapproachable. Of course it is. And that's the desire. Yeah. But it's, but it's so revealing that that's the ultimate fallback position. Yeah. We will take anything but God. And if you claim that design is, is, is <coughs> perceptible inside the universe... You just, you have just stepped in it. Them's fighting words. Well, uh, to me, at least in my own faith, that is the most revealing feature. Yeah. The ultimate fallback and an unprovable, unsaleable, under, not under. An not, uh, not understandable proposal. Totally untestable. 
It's not science anymore. Yes, it's and, meta science. But or, this is the basis of of, of this whole scientific uh, insistence right. on an origin that does not involve design. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you wind up with making a defense that is every bit as faith-based as anything in the most fundamentalist Christianity. That's an interesting way of saying it. Uh, to me, with you using the word just uh, just using the word faith, for them is faith in something that they can't evaluate. Right. Right. Well, faith is some uh, belief in something that you cannot prove, although you may have evidence for it, and so you can have evidence-based faith. You know, my 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 wife has always been here uh, twenty minutes after work. She's not here now. Um, she'll make it in just the next few minutes. You know, can I prove that? No. Anyway, you know. Uh, but but it's reasonable to believe that. You know, guy's never been late for his appointments. He'll be here, don't worry. And there'll probably be good reason why he's not here on the dot. Because he doesn't do this. That's faith in something that you can't prove, but for which you have a good deal of evidence. Um... Uh, the bank has always honored my checks before. Don't worry, it'll honor it this time. Could they change? Sure. You can't prove that. But you have reason to believe it. And the fact of the matter is we live most of our lives on on that kind of faith. Now, what what uh, what they usually try to say is faith is belief in something that you know isn't true. Well, I don't know. The multiverse comes pretty close to that. It defines it. Certainly there is no evidence for it. There can be no evidence for it. Do they call it science? Pardon me? Do they call it science? Well, it really defines a philosophy that at heart does not acknowledge any power outside of themselves. Yeah. And they know that they didn't create life, so it must have just happened. Because there cannot be an intelligence greater than us that would have done this. There just mathematically cannot have cannot be. And when we realize this, I think it will help us to not put so much faith in their pronouncements. And that's the thing I think is happening to Christianity in general, is it's, it's been too scared because it's felt like these people, they're scientists, they can get to the moon. You just, you just said something I'll comment on, and that is... Uh now you're talking about using whatever these principles are that had nothing to do with an originator to create extremely predictable outcomes. And that's about as much of a negation, a rejection of their starting position as you can come up with. Something came out of a multiverse from just random that allows us to, and on and on and on. Yeah. But uh, one more thing about this whole thing. I really have a hard time putting together Adam, if Adam was a historical person, then where do you put him in history? Because it must be a history. And that, to me, sounds like it's a lot easier solved with a short age than with a long age. Because do you put him 
as the ancestor of Homo erectus, that's two million years? Do you put him as the ancestor of the Crete footprints? That's 5.7 million years. Do you put him as mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam? In which case you're looking at 100,000, 200,000 well, years, something like that. I think we simplified it a, a few months ago. Yeah. Uh, this is where all the progenitors or, or the uh, inheritance of Lucy. That, that's where it's gone. And the, the one thing I learned in that that I was not aware of is that the lower part of the body was totally found in a different area and f fit modern human metrics better than anything found in the simian end of, of the yeah which raises now now you have to put now you have to put Adam two million years ago if you're going to really believe in an Adam like the biblical mm -hmm. story you've talked about faith but when you take these limbs and show they're totally human but they weren't human. They were part of a totally dissociated set of fragments we found several kilometers away. Yeah, and, and, they, and they used that. Now, you see, if the dating system is off, then suddenly all that stuff can be collapsed into a coherent story. And what that suggests is that we really need to look very carefully at the dating uh, uh, schema, and that that argues for short life creationism. Um, but of course, the the writers of the book don't want to go there. But that's kind of the second order uh, implication of what they're what they're arguing for. Anyway, um, it's going to be fascinating. I think that it would be interesting to take science in the old-fashioned sense, hypothesis generation, testing, et cetera, et cetera. If that's old-fashioned? Well, the, the, the new-fashioned sense, the, the new-fashioned sense is, the scientific consensus is that we came up out of, uh, we came up with, out of our own bootstraps and that there is no God. And you can exclude miracle from science. Um, that obviously was not the position of Isaac Newton, or of Robert Boyle, or of Michael Faraday, or of, um, or of James Clerk Maxwell, or of any number of physicists, uh, scientists of various kinds that you can mention. From the, the uh, more by the time you get to Einstein, there are very few scientists who believe in the Genesis record. Um, but uh, perhaps they missed something along the way. Uh, and I suspect what happened is that people who had the atheistic viewpoint wrapped themselves in the mantle of science, claimed that mantle for themselves, claim that anybody who puts miracles in is therefore violating science and and therefore basically tried to rule their opponent, their opponents out of court and i think that when we when we get that straightened out we're going to be a lot better off you sound like an optimist i don't think the world is going to get it straightened out but i think that it's possible that we may be able to show enough to where anybody who wants to be fair to the evidence uh, will be able to see where it points and will be able to acknowledge that point. Um, I think that I, if, if I was to try to put on my profit hat, what I think was likely to happen is eventually there will be a, an argument between a Christianity that kind of vaguely paints the Bible but doesn't really take it very seriously, accepts uh, kind of what the current scientific consensus is trying to give us and tries to baptize it and does a not very good job at it, 
but it turns out to be fashionable. Um, and it's confusing and therefore, in a sense, could be called Babylon. And, uh, and people who believe in the actual biblical record on this. That's what I think is, is likely to happen. And when that choice gets to be made by everybody, then uh, at least everybody in the Western world, the rest of the world actually doesn't pay as much attention to this as, as we sometimes think. This is really a, a, a problem of the United States, Canada, uh, Western Europe, and uh, places like Australia and New Zealand. The rest of the world uh, doesn't have the problem of trying to deny, uh, I, I suppose some universities in the rest of, uh, rest of the world will, will try to do that, but, but in general, uh, places like India, Africa, South America, Central America, that isn't a major issue most of the time. Until you get educated. Until what? Until you get educated. Until you get educated, yes. It's a problem of the educated world. But see, if the gospel of the kingdom is to be preached into all the world, it has to be preached to the educated people too. That's where it started. Yeah. And in some ways, it's a tougher mission field than any other mission field in the entire uh, world. Because the people are trained to believe that they actually know what they don't know. You sound like you're just describing our current politics in this country. Um, there, no, there, there is some spillover, yes. Well, there's, there's fundamental causation, in my view. Um, because as, as the rational world steps away, from believing, uh, from believing that uh, that evidence of outcomes is important, then the rest of the world does the same thing. It, for it, other things it allows you to be a highly paid professor in a major university. Pardon the cynicism. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, I think you're right about that. I, I've said enough. Anyway. Um, so next week we'll talk about theology and after that we'll talk about B.B. Warfield and then we will be done with the book. So uh, we have some things that are kind of cooking and hopefully we'll... I'll talk to you in a minute. Okay. Hopefully it will uh, uh, re... Uh, uh, it will... It will uh, uh, we'll have some... Uh, nice things that have kind of been waiting for a while that we'll be able to do. Uh, anyway, uh, so see you.